Good afternoon and welcome to the annual Chamber of Commerce Parliamentary Luncheon. I'm Will Pinot, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber, and I'll serve as the Master of Ceremonies for, for this afternoon. So it's my honor to establish protocol and recognize the dignitaries joining us this afternoon. I would ask you to hold off your applause until I go through the extensive list. Your Excellency the Governor, Martin Roper. Honorable Speaker, McKeever Bush. The Honorable Gloria McField Nixon, Acting Deputy Governor. The Deputy Premier, the Honorable Chris Saunders. Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Innovation, Investment and Social Development, the Honorable Andre Ebanks. Minister of Tourism and Transport, the Honorable Kenneth Bryan. Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing, Infrastructure, the Honorable J. E. Banks. Minister of Health, Wellness, and Home Affairs, the Honorable Sabrina Turner. Attorney General, the Honorable Samuel Bulgin. Parliamentary Secretaries, Ms. Heather Bodden, Mrs. Catherine E. Banks Wilkes, and Mr. Dwayne Seymour. Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Roy McTaggart. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Joseph Hugh. Member of Parliament, Ms. Barbara Connolly. Chief Officers, Heads of Departments, Statutory Authorities, Government Companies, and Members of Boards, Councils, and Committees. Chamber President, Shamari Scott. Chamber Executive and Council Members. Past Chamber Presidents, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together. So at this time, I'd ask everyone to please stand for the opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for bringing us together in fellowship as we share this meal and time together. We invite your presence among us today as we discuss issues that are of national importance to our beloved Cayman Islands. Inspire us to effectively use this time so that chamber members and government leaders can bond closer as a group and work in partnership to build a community rooted in love, respect, and compassion for all. Bless our appetites, both physical and spiritual, to honor you in all we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Please be seated. So today's luncheon would not be possible without the financial support of our three VIP partners for the event, Caribbean Utilities Company Limited, DART and Digicel. Each of these member businesses have joined us in hosting this event and I'd like to publicly thank them and acknowledge them for their contributions and support. Please put your hands together for them. So while you enjoy your lunch, let's proceed with the first presentation for today by one of our VIP partners, Caribbean Utilities Company Limited. Richard Yu graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Florida in 19, 1988, and then joined CUC and quickly rose to the ranks. He obtained a Master of Business Administration from the Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier University in Ontario, Canada, and was appointed President and CEO in 2005. He serves on several boards, uh, both locally and overseas. So please put your hands together and welcome Richard to the podium. You may think that CUC is just another electricity company, but we are so much more. We're an engaged corporate citizen, a significant Caymanian employer, and an integral part of the success of the Cayman Islands in the past and in the future. CUC has developed and trained hundreds of Caymanians since it started its operation over 56 years ago. We have provided scholarships to over 60 students for high school A-level studies and tertiary education, created formal vocational training and internship programs, and developed students as young as 15 years old who have been attracted to these opportunities that we have offered for the past 22 years. On an annual basis, we recruit, identify, and guide our most impressionable young citizens through these programs. Today, many of our past trainees and employees are in senior roles in organizations across the Cayman Islands. 84% of our employees are Caymanian, and we are committed to developing Caymanians for the benefit of our company and our country. 
Our actions are not merely a reflection of corporate responsibility. They are a reflection of a company with deep roots in this community. Our employees are fully committed and give of their time and talent to our society, whether at work or through charitable community involvement. Our business is capital intensive and for the past five years, we have invested over $240 million in infrastructure. Those funds were allocated to upgrade and expand our transmission and distribution system island-wide, our system control center, and to build two new substations, all with the goal of improving reliability and our level of service to our customers. We make this investment with the knowledge that a storm may cause significant damage to our exposed physical assets and that insurance companies will not insure the majority of our exposed transmission and distribution system against the risk. We mitigate the impact of this risk to the best of our ability by designing and building resilient systems which we construct carefully, ensuring that our poles are not overloaded and that we maintain our equipment. We have partnerships in place with our parent company Fortis Inc and suppliers throughout the world to ensure a swift response when a major storm hits. CUC began research in renewables as early as 2001. Since that early start, we visited Hawaii and many other locations, including Tucson, Arizona, and learned a lot from their programs in relation to solar energy. We are ready to proceed and have been ready for over five years with large-scale renewable energy sources that will bring safe, reliable, sustainable and low-cost electricity to all customers. Knowing the vision that our government and business owners have for Grand Cayman determines the strategy we have to put in place. Our business requires careful consideration of the future and the country's needs. Our strategy and planning horizons are in some cases as far out as 25 years. We have to make business decisions that will continue to make our service viable to our customers and which secure the future of the Cayman community. Electricity is considered a vital resource in the Cayman Islands as it is worldwide. Without electricity, the world would be a very different place and we are all reminded of the importance of this resource when there are outages. As simple as it sounds, you can have peace of mind knowing that when you flick the switch, you will have lights. Our islands are attractive to investors because we have a reliable electricity service. Your businesses work because you have a reliable electricity service and our children can learn and play knowing that they can plug in their devices as they wish. So when you think of CUC, just know that we are so much more than just an electricity company. We are much more than poles, trucks, and wires. We are performing tasks that are of paramount importance to the ongoing well-being and development of the people of the Cayman Islands. We have made a significant contribution to Cayman's development. We are proud of that contribution and we don't intend to stop here. We are community builders. We are empowering Cayman to be a global leader. Thank you. Uh, protocol having been established, good afternoon all. Thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to address you today. I'd just like to recognize the CUC team, the two tables, 32 and 33. They are the people that do all the hard work, and I get up here and maybe take the glory. In my brief time here today, I will highlight CUC's role and the value we bring to the electricity sector, now and in the future. We exist because the most practicable and economic way of providing homes and businesses with electricity is by building and maintaining an electricity grid. This brings lower costs due to economies of scale and higher availability of electricity to consumers compared to self-supply. Self-supply for the last 36 years has been a right available to all consumers. The electricity grid is a public good 
and it is also a natural monopoly as it makes no sense to bear the cost of more than one grid. CUC owns the grid but operates under license and is regulated by OFREG in accordance with various acts. This is an important distinction to those who refer to CUC as a monopoly. A true monopoly has all power to set prices and level of service as it wishes to maximize profits. That situation certainly does not exist for CUC. Our service level, our investment plans, and our returns are regulated. The regulator and regulations being a proxy to competition where a natural monopoly exists. Over the past five years, we have averaged 7% return on rate base, which is certainly not unreasonable when compared to the North American and regional electric utility industry. For the past 56 years, CUC has invested heavily in the transmission and distribution grid. For the past five years alone, our investment in T&D has been 137 million CI dollars. Our, obje our objective is for you as a customer to not have more than two hours of outage per year. And as at year end 2021, we were at 2.3 hours excluding major weather events. We have achieved this level of service while keeping your rates competitive in the region, as shown by the most recent Carolex survey for March 2022 bills. The survey showed CUC was in the middle of the pack in all customer categories. In operating the grid, CUC has the responsibility to ensure grid stability by continuously balancing the power demanded by consumers with the power generated onto the grid. Prior to 2008, CUC forecasted custom, customer demand and planned and installed capacity to meet that demand. However, CUC's generation license now differs from its transmission distribution license in that it's non-exclusive. Under this structure, CUC forecasts demand and plans for firm generation capacity. However, there is a competitive bid process conducted by the regulator to procure that capacity. The most recent of which was in 2015 when CUC provided the lowest cost bid for 40 megawatts of capacity. Energy costs in the recent years have averaged 12 CI cents per kilowatt hour. Now this is just the energy part and not the base rates which covers everything else. So it's mainly the fuel at this time. This month the fuel cost is 20 CI cents per kilowatt hour. Volatile energy prices are not good for consumers or CUC. Although fuel and solar costs are passed through to consumers without markup, higher costs hurt consumers and the economy that we aim to support. The solution to this problem is to replace diesel as our main source of energy and to move to renewables with lower and more stable costs. We know that wind energy has been more competitive than diesel since 2003 when CUC completed a study and embarked on a project to install wind turbines. The project failed due to potential conflicts with flight path regulations and interference with the Doppler weather radar system. In 2009, with permission from the regulator, we introduced the customer-owned renewable energy program, or CORE, as it is referred to. The program started on an avoided cost basis, meaning that we would pay the producer the avoided cost of diesel. There was little interest expressed at this price, and in order to get the program going in its infancy, we agreed with the regulator to pay the then estimated cost of producing electricity from small solar systems, which was 38 cents per kilowatt hour. This attracted more interest and take up, and as the cost of the technology decreased, so was the core rate with the last core offering at 17.5 cents and 15 cents per kilowatt hour, depending on the system size. In 2011, CUC ran a competitive tender process for utility-scale solar and introduced the island's first independent power producer 
operating the Bodentown Solar Plant under a long-term power purchase agreement with CUC. Today, we are paying less than 15 cents per kilowatt hour for energy from that farm. In 2016, CUC developed an integrated resource plan study, also known as the IRP, with public and other stakeholder input. This was a plan to green our grid, to provide low-cost electricity while meeting the international greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. We brought it to the public in 2017, and it was accepted by the regulator in 2019. It is now on our website for anyone who is interested in having a read. The study called for 140 megawatts of utility scale solar, battery storage, and conversion of CUC's generators to cleaner and more stable price natural gas, continuing the smaller scale rooftop solar program and the completion of the waste to energy plant at the landfill. These would lead to 68% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, with 60% of the energy coming from renewables with lower and more stable costs by 2030. We have made great progress on distributed solar or rooftop solar. Currently, we have 740 residential and commercial distributed solar installations connected and another 415 under construction to be connected to the grid. These represent approximately 14 megawatts of peak output during a sunny day. These consumer systems produce approximately 2% of the island's energy needs. However, they are also the most expensive form of energy on our grid, to date averaging 29 cents per kilowatt hour, which remains higher than the cost of diesel at its peak. I hasten to repeat that the most recent core price was between 15 and 17 and a half cents. Another constraint with the distributed solar is the intermittency. With the 14 megawatts output combined with the Bodentown Solar Farms, 5 megawatts, we now have 17, sorry, 19 megawatts of aggregate intermittent output. Each time a, a cloud passes over the sun, we lose this large block of generation, which has to be compensated for by CUC's diesel generators ramping up immediately to replace the lost generation and down as quickly to accommodate the increased output when the cloud passes. Without this fast response, we would have grid instability and interruptions in electricity service. CUC has received approval from Offreg for a 20 megawatt battery, which will assist the diesel generators with grid stability during loss of generation and also reduce fuel consumption. This project is underway and it is anticipated to come in line in late 2023. We are aware that the distributed solar industry is keen to continue expanding and it will once stability concerns can be remedied. CUC's license permits CUC to submit renewable energy projects to the regulator and in 2020, we submitted a utility scale solar plus battery storage project. The single project would have been capable of producing 11% of Grand Cayman's energy needs at lower and more stable costs than diesel, and if approved, would be coming online in the next few months. However, Offreg decided that the project had to go to competitive tender. We have accepted this, and we hope to participate in the competitive process. I mentioned previously that the IRP calls for a switch from diesel to natural gas. We have been exploring the possibility of utilizing liquefied natural gas for over a decade, and we know that the price of natural gas supply to the region has fallen. To be as forward-looking as possible, CUC ensured that most of our recent engines, 116 of our 161 megawatts of installed capacity, have the availability to switch from natural gas, from diesel to natural gas, and back if needed with the application of a conversion kit. Advanced technology will now allow the transportation of liquefied natural gas on a small scale. This means the natural gas infrastructure needs for smaller islands like Grand Cayman are substantially lower than what they were just a few years ago. 
investments into this new fuel type no longer need to come with the concern of stranded assets in an environment where the, there is rapid transformation required. CUC has finalized and presented a gas to power strategy to OFREG and to the government. If this project moves forward, it would provide a significant savings in fuel costs and reduce the CO2 impact from our diesel engines. Ladies and gentlemen, I could talk all day on this topic, but I recognize my time is limit limited. I wish, however, to leave you with CUC's vision for the future of the electricity sector in, on Grand Cayman. We will continue to build a robust, reliable, and resilient grid with key sections being placed underground to withstand major hurricanes as our indoor substations currently do. We will have a number of utility-scale solar plants connected to the grid to reduce the cost of energy. We will also connect large batteries to the grid to help with the stability and to store excess solar energy captured during the day to be released in the evening peak demand period. We will convert our diesel engines to run a natural gas to continue to serve as that firm capacity that takes us through late night when the batteries are drained and maintains output following prolonged cloudy periods or following hurricanes when many solar panels may be destroyed. We will support the completion of the waste to energy project and we will also purchase electricity from that plant. In this vision, we meet the national and global standards for emissions reductions and we actually reduce and stabilize electricity costs by 2030. We at CUC are committed, ready and able to bring this vision to reality, but it has to be a shared vision with all stakeholders bought in, as we do not have the power to unilaterally execute this vision. We are not adverse to competition, having accepted competition since 2008. We only ask that all stakeholders be held to the same standard as CUC. We expect that any and all generators connected to the grid do not contribute to grid instability and that their cost of energy is competitive. The premise on which we stand, and as I said up front, is that the grid allows all consumers to benefit from lower costs and higher availability due to larger scale. If we abandon this premise, the public good is eroded. We are ready, excited, I can't say another word, frustrated, everything. <laughs> we are ready, we just want to go, we need to move forward. We want to participate in this great energy transformation of Grand Cayman. Our vision statement is to empower Cayman to be a global leader. We must move now to green our grid, to reduce costs to consumers, and to demonstrate to the world our commitment to the environment. Again, thank you to the Chamber for this opportunity to share our plans for the future, and I thank you all for your time and attention. Well, thank you, Richard. So DART has been a supporter of this annual luncheon for several years, and we are delighted that they have returned again this year as our VIP partner. So the next presentation will be delivered by Jackie Doak. She's the president of business development at DART, where she directs the development and execution of DART's local and international business development strategy. For more than 18 years, she has been involved in creating exceptional places and experiences for, with DART. Her experience in commercial and residential real estate, knowledge of the corporate offshore industry, and talent for building mutually beneficial relationships makes Jackie a natural advocate for living and doing business in the Cayman Islands. Please welcome Jackie. Good afternoon. Protocol having been established. Thank you to Chamber of Commerce President Scott and to Executive Director Pinot for the opportunity to be a VIP partner here again today. At last year's parliamentary, parliamentary luncheon, we shared details of DART's long-term vision 
and commitment to sustainable development. We closed with a quote by Margaret Mead, how a small group of thoughtful and commit committed people can change the world. Today we would like to start with a quote by Helen Keller. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. We'd like to continue the discussion today and how together we, the public and the private sector, can collaborate and each play a role in contributing to the long-term sustainability of the Cayman Islands and create opportunities for shared prosperity. Alongside our VIP partner today, Caribbean Utilities, DART's vision for the future is fueled by renewable energy. DART was an early adopter of solar, added capabilities into existing properties, and incorporating into our future and ongoing designs. At the end of 2021, the total installed solar capacity was 1,410 kilowatts in more than 13 locations. We will be adding another 450 kilowatts in 2022 and are looking at other opportunities in other locations. And we recently announced our investment in Cayman BRAC Power and Light. We are working together with the experienced team and working with them on a strategic approach to renewable energy, reducing the reliance on diesel fuel with a near-term focus on Little Cayman. We are excited to be working alongside CUC, the Cayman Islands government, and others to collectively achieve the goals of the national energy policy. The R3 Foundation is a private sector foundation started during the pandemic to focus on Cayman's readiness, relief, and resiliency, and recovery, apologies, before, during, and after natural disasters and emergencies. The R3 Foundation was seeded by a one million donation from the Kenneth B. Dart Foundation. The, Kenneth, the foundation also committed to an additional four million in matching grants for those who donated to the foundation, whether corporations or individual donors. On the screen, you will see an excerpt from the R3 annual report showing the grants distributed and the contributions received to the R3 foundation. The R3 foundation is chaired by Brian Hunter and led by a group of professionals and committed community leaders. We would like to thank the current Board of Leaders and the Foundation, as well as original board member, Joanna Small. Matching grants through the R3 Foundation are a powerful way to double the impact of any donation, large or small. In February, the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development donated 1.5 million to the R3 Foundation to assist with ongoing housing repairs for vulnerable Caymanians, much as a result of grace. This was matched by the Kenneth B. Dart Foundation. Last month, the Kenneth B. Dart Foundation committed to provide another 1.5 million of matching contributions to the R3 Foundation, bringing our overall matching contributions to 5.5 million. The decision to provide additional matching funds was inspired by a donation from the Simpson Group of US $1 million, 500,000 of which they requested be earmarked for safety and security. The Simpson Group, the Kenneth B. Dart Foundation, are now in discussions with the governor and the R3 Foundation regarding the deployment of those funds to one or more national security programs. The private sector working together to ensure the continued safety and quality of these islands. In the spirit of Together is Better, we hope the news of the donation from Minister E. Brank's ministry and the Simpson Group will encourage additional contributions to matching grants from you, the business community. As with the Simpson Group, who airmarked 500,000 of their donation for the safety and security initiatives, you can donate with confidence that funds can be airmarked for initiatives that align with your company's values and priorities. If this has inspired you to action, please speak to Brian Hunter, Richard Hugh, or other of the R3 Foundation leaders here today. 
I'd like to transition to our youth, our future leaders. As with many in the private sector and with government who provide scholarships, we are committed to playing our role in educating and supporting our young Caymanians, our future leaders. Since inception in 2011, DART has funded 46 high school and college scholars. Through our DART Scholars Program, we are able to recognize and assist some of the brightest young minds in reaching their full potential and attending world-class universities. Of the 29 university scholars, 19 are studying and eight have graduated and are working in the US, Europe, and in Cayman, some for the DART group and some for other companies. And today, we are delighted to announce the 2022 DART scholars, Jake Fagan, Sirichandara Bata, and Adrian Phillips Hernandez. They were announced yesterday, so congratulations to our new scholars. In addition to the scholarships, WorkX provides paid work experience for DART scholars and other Caymanian University student, students. This summer, we had 29 students at DART during the school year, and we've also hosted an additional 20 students, including SciFex students, some for up to six months. And Mind Inspired is our robust program of STEM activities for children of all ages. And it includes the successful high school robotics program. And the Cayman national team is going to Geneva in October to compete against 180 countries. And next month, DART is piloting a, piloting a paid hospitality training program in collaboration with WORK for 15 young Caymanians who will gain real world experience in our hotels, including the Ritz Carlton. I'm gonna transition now to sustainable development. Over the years of investment, we have played our role in being a catalyst for economic development and prosperity while raising awareness of the value proposition of the Cayman Islands, providing new places to stay with Hotel Indigo. And today we welcome the news of a new direct flight to Los Angeles commencing on the 5th of November opening up a new gateway and new customers and new business travelers and leisure travelers to the Cayman Islands. That was a great announcement. We also respond to market growth in financial services and FinTech with 60 Nexus Way, our 200,000 square foot office building of commercial office and retail. And we respond to market needs with KPOC, our residential for lease in the Kamana Bay Town Center. Two of these major projects will be completed later this year, with the Indigo project opening for season in, October, in 2024. And last year at this luncheon, we endorsed an environmental management framework, a framework that would help balance the country's environmental, social, and economic interests by providing a clear roadmap for sustainable development that aligns with the goals of existing and future legislation such as the National Development Plan and the National Conservation Law. This is really worth repeating. On one end of the spectrum, there are lands and habitats which are highly sensitive and of significant environmental importance, which absolutely need to be protected. And on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, there are lands which, if developed, have the opportunity to provide the greatest economic benefits to the country. And in the middle, where the value is not as clearly defined, having such a framework would be invaluable to guide the decision making. A comprehensive environmental management framework informed by all stakeholders that reflects a shared vision for the future would provide clear guidance and greater certainty on how land can, be, how land can and should be protected, managed, or developed. We shared our perspective last year that the division seems to be more intense than it actually is, when ultimately the majority of the community is seeking the same broad outcomes of a sustainable Cayman Islands. However, the lack of clarity not only leads to uncertainty, it has created unnecessary polarization in the community, and that continues today. 
and we are committed to preserving natural habitats and biodiversity. In Cayman, we pioneered new urbanism and biodiversity net gain at Kamana Bay. Biodiversity net gain delivers measurable improvements by creating habitats in association with development. This approach has continued throughout our developments and we have a track record of retaining and creating new habit habitats as we develop. In our landscaping, in roundabouts, in the road verges and medians, in parks and in open spaces. When the ETH was widened and extended, we planted hundreds of local and endemic trees and plants from our nursery and took great care to protect plants and species, including those that are the larval food source for Cayman's pygmy blue butterfly. The landscape around Fosters and CIS was also designed to attract more species of butterflies, as well as other safe pollinators that are critical for Cayman's growing agricultural output. We also planted 80 species of Cayman sage around Fosters. Once thought extinct, it's still critically endangered. And the Cayman sage was actually rediscovered by Carla Foster Reed, so it was a fitting location around Fosters. And the new Splash Park at Seafire is now encircled by a botanic tree park featuring all the native palms, wild jasmine, sapodilia, red birch, and parrot berry trees designed to attract Cayman parrots and other birds not commonly spotted among Seven Mile Beach. And the remediation of the cap and capping of the Georgetown landfill will also provide environmental benefits and opportunities for the creation of future uh, habitats on a very large scale. We are playing our role in preserving and creating habitat. There is a UN goal of 30% land conservation through area-based conservation methods by 2030. For over 25 years, we have been identifying and preserving hundreds of thousands of acres around the world for recreation and conservation purposes. For perspective, this is several times over the land mass of the Cayman Islands that we currently have for land conservation. They are pristine places in areas such as Patagonia and areas of Chile and Argentina, forests of New Zealand and Canada, Blue Mountain areas of Jamaica, and here in the Cayman Islands. There is a beautiful photograph of, um, that demonstrates how recreation and conservation can coexist. We take a long-term perspective with our developments and investment in Cayman. We are a small group of islands with limited land mass. And we hope that on Grand Cayman, consideration will be given to increase building heights in designated zones, coupled with a long-term, multi-generational plan for a development retreat from Seven Mile Beach, allowing the natural restoration of the shoreline. This is not new. We endorse sustainability and climate resili resiliency initiatives we are advocates for deeper setbacks and increased building heights that reduce the development footprint and sprawl. It allows for the retention of more open spaces, essentially to encourage development to go up versus out in certain areas. We believe this is consistent with global climate resiliency and sustainability efforts. We support the review and update of the National Development Plan and while the review, consultation, and amendments to the national plan follow the legislative process, we will await the outcome prior to planning or commencing any major new developments in Grand Cayman or the, Cayman, or the Sister Islands. We will focus on projects already in the pipeline, as well as enhancing our existing places and spaces, and continuing our commitments to the community. As mentioned, we have and continue to invest in sustainable, sustainable development and protecting the terrestrial habitat. Looking forward, as the Cayman Islands' largest investor, with an unwavering confidence in the country's future and with a long-term perspective, we would like to share DART's acre for acre pledge with you today. In any future DART developments, for every acre that is disturbed, 
we will commit an acre of untouched natural habitat to be held for conservation. This is at the core of an environmental management framework, preserving and protecting lands that are environmentally sensitive while developing land that has the opportunity to provide the greatest economic benefit for the country, acre for acre. The land for conservation would be identified in ecologically important areas, such as the central mangrove wetlands, Barkers, and the sister islands. In the spirit of together is better, in the spirit of community, a theme you have heard today, we hope our Acre for Acre pledge is a catalyst for other developers and government to adopt a similar philosophy with future development projects and commit to an Acre for Acre when developing untouched natural habitats. In addition to the land currently preserved by the Crown, the National Trust, and DART, we estimate that over 39,000 acres of untouched terrestrial habitat remains on the Cayman Islands. And as Richard said when he was up here, we are ready, acre for acre, by the stroke of a pen, whether by voluntary pledge from others or through legislation, this could result in over 30% of the island's land mass forever being preserved, exceeding the UN goal for biological diversity. Decades ago, the Cayman Islands became a global financial services powerhouse through the ingenuity and commitment of the government and business professionals working together. Today again, by working together, acre for acre, the country could become a global world leader in land conservation, protecting wildlife and habitat, and inspiring all landholders to become environmental stu stewards of the future. I will close with our vision and thank you for your time. I'd now like to introduce the President of the Chamber of Commerce, Shamari Scott. Many of you probably know Shamari wearing several hats. One stage he was our Director of Tourism. He led us through some challenging times during the years that he served there. Now he's an outstanding leader with Health City, bringing health care to the grasp of not only our local Caymanians, but around the world through international health care. Um, people coming in from all over the world through the work that Shamari is doing, traveling to different Caribbean islands, and in, indeed some of the developed countries to bring tourists, medical tourists, to our country, in some cases to save their lives. I, I think it's remarkable work that he does if you put your hands together. My health city is an amazing place. It's my pleasure to work with such an outstanding leader, not only because he's my boss, but because he's a great human being. So put your hands together for Shamari Scott. Seeing as we're live streaming, um, I just want Dr. Newton to see I had my mask on indoors. We won't tell her I only put it on to walk up to the podium, however. Um, good evening, or it's evening or afternoon to everybody who is here. And I thank Will for that introduction. Um, just before we got up here, Will was like, do you want me to introduce you? And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. He's like, you don't want me to big you up? I'm like, no, no, I'm good. And then he said, no, 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 I have to big you up. Um, but just to let Will know that there's no money in the budget for the raise, so. <laughs> I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for those kind words. Uh, protocol already being established. I love the fact when other people you know, bring protocol so I don't have to go through the long list, but still want to definitely um, thank His Excellency for taking the time to be here this evening. Also want to thank other government ministers that also took the time to be here. And obviously, my Minister of Health, who is there with our Health City team as well. I have a difficult task right now because I thought we were being innovative and I have two videos that we're gonna play during my presentation. However, you're gonna to have to listen to me speak without any slideshows, so you're just gonna to have to look at my beauty and be captivated by that. I hope my wife is smiling and laughing at that, is she? Oh yeah, she is, okay. 
This luncheon is always a highlight of the chamber year. We gather in partnership and fellowship and break bread together while we discuss the state of our beloved islands, the economy and issues that matter most to us. Before lunch, two strategic partners provided us with important updates, and I'd like to thank CUC and DART for utilizing today's luncheon to share their messages. The Chamber is certainly not oblivious to the global challenges that face our islands and the region. Supply chain shortages, the increase in costs of doing business, escalating fuel prices, a limited supply of affordable housing, interest rate hikes, and the prediction of the looming stagflation is enough to send any economist into a panic attack. And not to mention that little event, you know, the pandemic and its impact on the tourism sector as well as healthcare. But while these challenges are unlikely to disappear anytime soon, they're signs of hope for our economy. Tourism is recovering, patches and gaps in healthcare are being filled to the brim for a fully independent future state. Access and availability to local and international labor is being restored. And the two years of economic turmoil is being replaced with promise and opportunities to our members, most of which are small and micro businesses that employ fewer than 12 workers. Cautiously optimistic is resurfacing to the fore, as that was a phrase that was used after the tsunami of financial tsunami of 2008. So while we're optimistic, we're cautiously optimistic at this point in time. Cayman's financial services industry remains strong. The sector beamed through a shining beacon of light radiating through the dark economic storm clouds. And we must do everything in our power to innovate, support, and expand the sector, which contributes to more than 60% of our government coffers annually. Minister of Financial Services, the Honorable Andre Ebanks, and his ministry team should be acknowledged for their leadership and recent efforts to improve the relationship with key decision makers in the United Kingdom and Europe. The ministry, in partnership with the industry, is working vigorously to demystify and shatter the misconceptions about Cayman's international financial services industry. Now, in my speech, it says pause for applause. I don't hear any applause. So I'm going to give the cue. All right. uh, I, I was at another dinner where the Honorable Linford Pearson said when he was young um, at the game and he was speaking, he was so nervous, he read, it, he read his notes, and after saying one line, then he said, clap, 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 <laughs> and kept reading. So, you know, I didn't want to do that, but I still wanted to hear the applause. But now it's our turn to extend our hand and offer further support, Minister. As many may know, the Chamber produced an award-winning animated video series known as Growth Matters in 2017. The series educated students and the wider community about how the Cayman Islands economy works and why sustainable growth matters. It's been viewed by thousands of persons on various social media platforms. The Chamber Council has taken the bold step of continuing the animated series focusing next on each of Cayman's two economic pillars, international financial services and tourism. The next series will be called, yes, Financial Services Matters. Um, I know that's not an innovative name, but it's still catchy. Can we have a, clap, a round of applause for that one? <laughs> that one wasn't in my speech, but you know, I felt I needed the applause. Uh, following consultation with the Ministry of Financial Services and industry partners, we have developed a short teaser video that I hope you will enjoy. <laughs> Here in the Cayman Islands, we have lots to be proud of. We've grown to become a global economic powerhouse. Thanks to our well-regulated and trusted financial services. That's why reputable investors love doing business here. In our upcoming series, we'll break down our financial services industry, shatter widespread misconceptions, and effectively boost our global image. We'll also provide insights into why global citizens choose our thriving International Financial Center, do a deep dive into what sets our professional services apart, and finally, look at the road that led us here. 
We'll show you why leading investors trust the Cayman Islands. All right. So I was going over my speech last night and I was watching the video just to see how it would fit within. And Isaiah, who is four years old, Will, gave you two thumbs up. He came, he sat, he watched, and he said, that's really good. So if everybody's like Isaiah, I'm sure it's going to do wonderful things. Now, shattering misconceptions about the industry and explaining the services that this, service, that this sector offers to our international clients is the focus of the video series. The industry is urged to become a sponsor, and if you haven't already committed, please do so, and share the videos with the clients once released. We want the videos to receive the widest audience possible. Working together, we can educate students as well as clients and investors about why this industry remains the backbone of our economy and its importance for the future. Vocational and technical careers promotion, workforce development and training, micro and small business support and development, and restoring of the economic, of economic growth are at the fore of the Chamber's advocacy agenda for this year. To achieve results, we'll work in partnership with various ministries and government departments, and our islands have always thrived on that close-knit working relationship between public and private sectors. This partnership is pivotal to our success, and the Chamber will do everything in our power to seed, to preserve, and to nurture it. After all, building a sustainable and resilient Cayman is a team effort. The Deputy Premier's and Minister of Tourism's efforts to motivate and prepare Caymanian students and school leaders to take on key roles in tourism and the wider workplace should be supported. The portfolio of civil service efforts to place returning Caymanian students into internships in government during the summer is another outstanding program and the Chamber plans in this year and years to come to encourage all of our private sector members to become involved in this initiative in the years ahead. Summer internships is a catalyst for wedging our feet in the door of opportunity, which has many times led to that jump start for our career. Our national focus should always be on investing and providing Caymanians with every opportunity that we can so that they can take up their rightful roles within our society. Expanding the economy without focusing on this important task will only lead to division and discontent. Like the African proverb once said, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Let's all embrace our social contract in regards to who we are developing for. Another way the Chamber will assist in this effort is by increasing awareness of non-traditional vocational and technical positions and careers. We are assisting the Ministry of Education who understand the challenge and opportunity at hand about attracting Caymanians into these fields by firstly educating and informing about the tremendous opportunities that exist. We must collectively do a better job of preparing, motivating, and placing Caymanians into these roles. One way, that's awesome, I didn't even have to say applause. <laughs> One way is by asking Caymanians who are actually working in these non-traditional careers to share their stories of success while we elevate these career paths. This afternoon, I am pleased to introduce the first set of Caymanian Votech stars in a short video that promotes the campaign that will come. My name is Lakeisha Mason. I'm a combination plans analyst in the Department of Planning. Well, I'm Cameron Dew, a local West Bay boy, born and raised, 24 years old. Uh, currently, I'm a dive instructor. But hopefully, one day, I'll own my own dive resort. Well, my name is Anton Powell. I'm an apprentice technician here at Polar Bear. My name is Levante Ray. Firefighter employed at Cayman Islands Fire Service. My name is Joshua Smith and I'm a heavy equipment operator in island recycling. My name is Allison Hidalgo. I've been working in the water sports industry, uh, particularly as a photographer, tour guide, and I've also served as an operations supervisor or operations manager. 
I'm a Votex star. I am a Votex star. I am a Votex star. Each Votex star will be featured in a separate video to promote the vocational and technical career that he or she is employed. Each video will be released on social media and in the wider media so that Caymanians will become excited about these career opportunities. A reception will be held to honor these stars and to recognize these individuals. We want to celebrate their achievements, passion, and success. Each Votex star will be invited to go into our schools and pay it forward and show their video and share their passion and experience with the goal of attracting more Caymanian students to pursue these vocational and technical career paths. I'd like to thank Cayman Contractors Association, Fosters, Health City Cayman Islands, and Inspire Cayman Training for sponsoring these videos. If your business would like to support this new chamber initiative, please contact Will at the chamber office. Now, building resilience and economic sustainability extends beyond non-traditional careers and industries and into our local communities. For the first time, sustainability and resilience are two subjects identified as ministerial responsibilities. That's the good news. But the challenge is now how do we define and prioritize actions to put these platforms into focus? Certainly, national development planning should be at the forefront. How can we say we're building a resilient and sustainable society without a national blueprint with measurable goals and achievable targets? How do we measure our success? I recall a colleague of mine previously that used to scream, you can't manage what you can't measure. And that's the truth. If you don't know where you're going and you don't know what success looks like, how can you measure whether or not you've been successful? Now, market forces and global challenges will always distort and shift the sands of physical and social development. But we must have a rock solid vision for what we consider to be the ideal future in terms of our natural and man-made environment for those who live here. Should additional measures be taken now to preserve our environment and to protect our landmass, coral reefs, marine life, mangroves, and unique creatures? Will our children be pleased with our actions that we have taken? Or will they be ashamed of us for not making the difficult decisions and introducing sufficient measures to protect our environment? That being said, as with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and my mother being the teacher, she would say, make sure you remind people what that is. So the reminder is that that's a theory that states humans are motivated to fulfill their needs in a hierarchical order. This order begins with the most basic needs before moving on to more advanced needs. For the highest level of those needs of self-actualization, we can concentrate on the greater good and a better future state. However, in contrast, for those that are at the beginning stage of the physiological needs and safety needs, what rings most important is food, shelter, employment, and property, which is currently in question for many. We must focus on both, as you can't achieve one without the other. It's a difficult balancing act akin to a tight rope across treacherous waters with the promise of the Caymanian dream at the other side as the end destination. We can and must and will get it right as we're all invested in the most special economic miracle on earth that we call the Cayman Islands. In closing, these are certainly weighty discussions that the Chamber and the wider community will be willing to discuss in the future. This will be one of the topics on our agenda for the upcoming Economic Forum that we're planning in partnership with the Ministry of Economic Development and the Ministry of Commerce later this year. We are pleased to see that our economy has started to have that jump start and is being restored. We also believe it's a perfect time now to engage in a national conversation about our future so that all Caymanians and stakeholders can come together to ensure the brightest future possible. The Chamber is eager to engage in the conversation and I trust you all are as well. Thank you for your attention and I hope I was beautiful enough to keep your attention during those short 10 minutes. Thank you.
Now we're gonna keep the um, evening rolling or the afternoon rolling. And just to let you know that, you know, um, Minister Ebanks as well as myself, we didn't eat lunch because we needed to keep our figure coming up here to speak as well as, you know, we have our game face on and we're ready to deliver our part of the game, which see he's stretching now, he's getting ready to come up here to do his part. Uh, Minister Ebanks has the lofty task of, as with any team, subbing in. So our premier gives his apologies that he obviously isn't here to join us today just due to um, having COVID. However, he has an eager and willing and capable teammate that's also the Minister for Innovation, um, as well as the Minister for uh, Commerce, which is the perfect fit for him to come up and give the keynote address that he has owned um, as his own, as well as to do the fireside chat afterwards. Now, the Honorable Andre Ebanks, MP, is a Minister for Financial Services and Commerce, as well as Investment, Innovation, and Social Development, following his election to the Cayman Islands House of Parliament in April 14 of 2021. Under his remit for Financial Services and Commerce, there is the General Registry, Department of International Tax Cooperation, Department of Commerce and Investment, Trade and Business Licensing Board, Liquor Licensing Board, Special Economic Zones Authority, Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, Auditors Oversight Authority, Cayman Islands Stock Exchange, Stock Exchange Authority, Civil Aviation Authority, Air Transport and Licensing Authority, Marine, Marine Time Authority of the Cayman Islands, Cayman Islands Government Offices that are overseas, as well as the Financial Services Legislative Committee. So I just went through all of that. So anytime you think that the ministers are doing nothing, that's just one area and um, that Minister Ebanks is responsible for. He has another remit for investment, but I won't go through that list. I think you all get the point. Um, so the Chamber Council and I have established an ex excellent relationship with the Minister um, for Financial Services, Minister Ebanks. Since the election, he is very responsive, he's attentive, and any concerns that we have brought to him by our members, he looks forward to finding solutions and to build on that relationship. And we look forward to similar relationships that we have across the board for years to come. Without further ado, I welcome our keynote speaker, the Honorable Andre Ebanks. for Dr. Newton. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank the chamber for this opportunity to allow the government to make a few remarks at this auspicious occasion. And I offer uh, apologies on behalf of the Honorable Premier who has been, has contracted COVID. He sounds very rough, but I told him that's no excuse. He should have soldiered on. I shouldn't be in this position. Now, the thing is, the, the Premier has done this to me before. I don't know if anyone from Cayman Finance was there in 2016 at the annual Cayman Finance New York Breakfast 2016 Harvard Club. Any, was anybody there? Well, I was on staff and he was in my current role as Minister for Financial Services, got sick the morning of, and then gave me his speech to read. See, Obasdale, were you there? I just, I just thought you weren't, see, you weren't there either. And he was my boss at the time. <laughs> and I had to read this cold. Now, the difference with that speech is that I was on staff and heavily contributed to writing it, so I knew it. In this case, <laughs> I get summoned to the premier's office at 8 o'clock last night to say, you're going to have to fill in for the premier. All right, well, if you've got to prepare it, I'll just read it and go, go off the stage. Actually, we haven't had time to really sit with him because he's been down and we only kind of have an outline. So who else is speaking? CUC, 
chamber, dart. I was like, okay, so that means I'm following the always rational Richard Hugh, <laughs> dynamic Jackie Doak, and Super Shamari. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and your dad RSVP'd, so my dad's here. <laughs> so you have no text, all these superstars are speaking. Yeah, but we think you could do it. So at this point, my feeling is this. Let's hope the clicker works. <laughs> I get a night's sleep. My wife asked me the next morning, this morning, how you feeling? Still like this. <laughs> but it's going to be OK. So the chief of strategy, Pilar Bush, says it's going to be OK. Let's just sit, sit here and hammer things out. All right, well, what does is, what is the premier want to get across? What's the vision? So the vision is, he thinks we can build on our foundation of financial services and tourism, and we're well positioned to be a global center of excellence and innovation. So okay, that sounds good. I said that before. I said that in the budget debate last year. But I don't want something that's just going to sound like pie in the sky. We have real challenges that we got to get over. So how do we make it real? And literally, in a flash, it came to both myself and Pilar Bush at the same time. So you know what this is like? This is kind of like that interview about a year or so ago with J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon and David Rubenstein. Anybody watch Bloomberg? Anybody watch the David Rubenstein interviews? Well, in this interview, they were, they were, listen to what Mr. Dimon has to say. Now, mind you, he's talking about the U.S., but I assure you I'm going to draw a parallel to KMAT. Nine. I, I don't buy that. When we look at the economy, I always look, where are the potholes? So we did see potholes in 07 and 08 and leverage and mortgage. There are no real potholes there, okay? 15 million more people are working. Wages are going up. Stock price is much higher than where they are. We need to build more homes. Uh, people are spending their money. Uh, markets are wide open. Companies are flush with cash. There's no immediate pothole. And, you know, you can see some, you know, again, but they're not systemic. You know, auto loans might be a little bit of stretch. Student lending, there's too much uh, bad student lending. But they're not going to sink the American economy. They're just going to slow it down or something like that. I should point out that in America, because you, you hear the politics of today about uh, you know, all the serious problems we have, and we have them. But I give the other way around. America has the best hand ever dealt of any country on this planet today, ever. Okay? And Americans don't fully appreciate what I'm about to say. We have peaceful, wonderful neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We have all the food, water, and energy we will ever need. Okay? We have the best military on the planet, and we will for as long as we have the best economy. We have the best universities on the planet. They're great ones elsewhere, but these are the best. We still educate uh, you know, most of the kids who start businesses around the world. We have a rule of law, which is exceptional. We have a, a magnificent work ethic. We have innovation from the core of our bones. You can ask anyone in this room, what can you do to be more productive? Ask your assistants, factory floors, we do it. It's not just the Steve Jobs, it's the broad death. We're the wisest and deepest financial markets the world's ever seen. Okay? And if you, I just made a list of these things, and maybe I missed something. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And we have it today. Yes, we have problems, but we've been shooting ourselves in the foot, in my opinion. We've done a pretty good job shooting ourselves in the foot. Now, the parallel I'm going to draw, obviously we don't have a number of those things that the U.S. has, right? We don't have a military. But think about the parallel of Cayman in this region. I'm submitting to you all, in this region and among international financial services centers, we have the best hand dealt. We are ahead. So don't get bogged down in problems. Don't, don't, don't see what he said as talk about the potholes. We are ahead. So if I were to transpose his list to us, we have beautiful natural environment. We have intelligent, talented people. We have concentration of capital. We're relatively safe. We have a reputation as a leader and best in class in services. We have the rule of law. We have an incredibly strong judicial bench. Financial wherewithal. Excellent, almost destined geographical position. Fixed exchange rate. Peaceful, docile society. We have a premium tourism product impacted by the pandemic, yes, but on its way back, as Shamari Scott said. 
and a thriving, sophisticated financial services industry. There are people around us who would be dying for that list. And it's time for us to recognize it, cherish, but to the Premier's point, build on it. And to take a second to pause on financial services, so, so those of you who may not be in it directly get the magnitude of this. Some of you may have heard me say this at another regulatory conference about a month or so ago. It's kind of hard to see deliberately because I wanted the, the effect. That is a timeline from the 60s to 2021 of all the regulation passed, not of the country, of what financial services here is operating under. And along that timeline, there were moments in time, 2001, 9-11, the world brought in new regulation. I remember working at RBC Bank, like I, like I mentioned the last, at a conference ago with Mr. Harry Chisholm. He's going, oh boy, Whew, I don't know how we're gonna get through this. The world's got all this new AML. Nothing happened. We kept growing. You remember US FACA was gonna be the big beast that was gonna take us down. Everybody was running around scared. Nothing happened, we grew. Along the way, we have continuing regulation that comes, but what cannot be stopped is that we operate, that taxes are paid where they're owed, we facilitate the information, and we circulate global capital. That's why it continues to grow. And that's what we have to get the world to continue to understand, that we are not a problem, we are a partner. See, Shamara, you got them so trained, I didn't even have to do, I didn't have to do clap, clap, clap. Gave me the layout. Gave me the layout. So think, think of these remarks now as a track me of ready, set, go. I think we're ready. We are a, our vision should be of what we're going for is to be renowned as one of the most sustainable countries in the world peaceful, prosperous, where everyone can thrive and live their best life. Now, we can do it by taking the opportunity and the chance to layer on top of our world-class regulatory and legal framework the new opportunities that are staring us in the face in terms of ESG, tech, and healthcare. We could do this by, after all those advantages that, that I listed, give ourselves an additional advantage. Using our accounting, our risk and, uh, risk and asset management frameworks, we have the opportunity to leapfrog the competition and become that global center of excellence, creating new jobs, good jobs, and sometimes borderless jobs in a digital economy. Now, we have to be careful because we can't be all things to all people. We have to stay in our lane. We have a blue chip product here. But what we have to do is identify the opportunities that match with us, cultivate our country around a specific ecosystem, and explore these new areas. In health, Cayman is significantly stronger and better funded system than many other places in the region and some places around the world. But it doesn't mean we don't have our challenges. Patients are increasingly becoming more active consumers of healthcare rather than just being say, simple, grateful citizens. They have, we're looking for choice, timeliness, convenience, and becoming, uh, becoming more important to the population. They want rapid access. They want safe, they want safe services. Patients have a higher level of customer service requirements. But new technology can help with that. You now have the ability at the advent of COVID, and I hope that's the last time I mentioned COVID today, where you now have medical tech online. You now have artificial intelligence with devices that can monitor wearables and monitor your health situation, making life easier. We do, have, around the world, there are challenges because populations are growing and they're aging. And don't get me wrong, it's a good thing that people are living longer, but we have to figure out how we are going to treat people longer as you get older, as you get more elderly and you get weaker, and that you rest in dignity. 
And one of the greatest challenges facing healthcare and about many other industries is the supply of the workforce. There's a, there's a challenge right now in terms of finding sustainable solutions of healthcare, although they're intrinsically linked as a work for, to the workforce shortage that are driven by salary inflation and through supply and demand. But we can fill, we can fill these vacuums. So I'm pleased to say that Minister Turner and her team, with the full support of the government, will lead a national effort to balance treatment focus in this country with a greater emphasis on wellness, pre prevention, and screening. We intend to establish an independent institute of public health by January 2024 which will focus on prevention, research, and to be a regional center of excellence. Now, I want to take a quick moment. I don't see her. Is, is Dr. Newton here? No, she's not here. But I'll just still stay and pause and thank her for the work over these many months. I just happened to sit in the... I just happened to by chance, sit in the position in the cabinet conference room that's right next to her or anybody else comes to present. And to see the meticulous way that she goes over facts, gives her opinion under extraordinary pressure, I think is to be applauded as the same work ethic that I saw from Dr. Lee. So thank you, Dr. Newton. <laughs> now, if I could now pivot now to, to tech. We want to create an ecosystem of excellence that allows investors, allocators of capital, startups, developers, growth companies to innovate and grow and thrive in Cayman. It's, it's important because it's happening all around us. Whether we jump into the space or not, other countries are. So we can sit around, let it go past us, or we grab, we grab it on with both hands because it's going to have the ability to increase our efficiency, it's going to have the ability to reduce cross-border transfer costs, and it's going to have the ability to facilitate international cooperation. Cayman is well positioned to do this for several reasons. Firstly, we have our virtual assets framework, which has been approved by the FATF, Financial Action Task Force. We have a stable platform that's adaptable and tech-friendly. We're now working on phase two to ensure that we get the commercial aspects right and can balance the regulatory with the new business that's coming. Secondly, we have the ability to match these new industries with our traditional finance, and that's our lane, to build virtual assets around pre-existing finance products of custody, administration, funds, banking, and other areas. This is exciting stuff. In addition to that, we're completing the digital ID program, which is, as I've mentioned in a few meetings, this is data that the government already holds on you. So don't have any kind of conspiracy theory that that means if you get the digital ID, I can see you in the shower. It's not like that. This is information that the government already holds on you, but unified in one instrument, which will make life easier for you in terms of passing your KYC documentation between banks to make the passport renewal process that's sometimes so painful for Cayman, me included, I get rejected in the line, make it easier for you, make your life more efficient, give you hours back in your life, make us faster and throw us into the future. We ha also have to recognize how we intersect with ESG and finance. I asked Richard, I asked you if I could call you out. So I'm going to call you out because Richard is always chasing me every time he sees me about the intersection between finance and ESG. And he's right. I asked Jimmy Birchall if I could call him out because he's right in the sense that we already have this, this data. Our investment funds are already in the ESG space. We need to marshal that data, hi Seema, and put it into a form that we have statistics that we can show the world our narrative that we're already in this space and this is how Cayman, our little country, is a warrior in the battle on climate change because we're facilitating capital to fix these problems. 
Taken together, I guess what I'm saying to you is, we uh, can shift our financial institutions and strategize to operate in this new world. We can see Cayman being the, see the beginning of Cayman turning from just a financial center to an innovative center, building on our track record of compliance and international standards, which are all there. Another point I want to make about tech that's outside of financial services slightly is the new area that's coming up. Anybody heard of the metaverse? Anybody heard of the metaverse? For any of the parents that are in the audience, this isn't just about video games. This is actual high paying jobs that young Caymanians can get into if we build education pathways to it. This isn't just a hobby. This is serious business. We also have the ability now, what tech does, is leapfrog us into industries that we didn't have a shot in. So this is where film comes in. So imagine Lord of the Rings being shot. It would always go to New Zealand. They've got the hills and the mountains and the rivers. We don't have that. But now you can build a tech soundstage and shoot that digitally and bring Caymanians into that part of the workforce to be able to do post-production work, writing, screening, acting can all be done here. And this, is, this isn't just pie in the sky, that's part of the logic behind the new LAX route, to build that bridge to the West Coast, to bring in tech entrepreneurs, to bring in that sort of Hollywood talent that Frankie Flowers Jr. is always chasing me around about. That's how we're gonna do it. We have to build these pathways. And we have to then be able to prepare our people for the digital machine economy that is coming. It, it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. An ATM goes up, but if you look around, I'm not throwing the bankers under the bus, but you'll see less tellers than when I worked at a bank. So then what do we do? We can't be afraid of the tech. What we have to do is have it work in compatible to be able to upskill our people to the next level of jobs that they can now take forward and not worried about the machine. There can be harmony between the digital machine economy, but we're not gonna do it unless we continue to educate our people adjust the curriculum to take advantage of this. Seema can tell you that meetings that we're having right now with major blockchain companies that are looking to set up in Cayman, after all the tricky regulatory questions that they asked me that I studied the night before, and all the tech questions that I studied the night before, they then ask, will you have the workforce in 10 years to sustain my business? Now, I can say I'm not the Minister of Education and give kind of a waffly answer, but the truth of the matter is we have to be able to solve that because it's fine for them to establish here, bring their employees here, but if they're genuinely saying that they want Caymanians to be the partners in their firm that they establish here in 10 years, we've got to get our youth ready for that. My um, main sociology professor um, in the US used to say after we used to have these long sessions talking about the world's problems, yeah, well, how are we gonna solve this? He used to always have the, the easiest answer that, that still I think rings true. The answer to most of your social economic problems is a good job. So he used to say. And I think that still holds true today. We've got to be able to move our people to stronger median incomes. Is Mark Vanderville here? Tell him I said this, Jackie. He's always talking about the barbell economy, right? And what he means is, is that you'll have heavy upper class, heavy lower class, and a thin middle class. We cannot have that. That won't, I don't have the strength to lift that. But what we can do is lift the medium up to have a stronger, equal economy. And that way, when you meet turbulent times where there's soaring cost of living, there's interest rates increase, there's rising oil prices, the jobs are more resilient to that. So that is how I think we set our feet. So ready, we have the instruments in place. We can set our feet because we can see the pathway, we can see the track. But what do we need to go? In the near term, it's passing enabling legislation and policy. 
accelerating overdue infrastructure changes, improving access to the banking system, particularly for tech companies, creating what I mentioned before, the improved education pathways for our students and adults and adults in the workforce to train and retrain for these new exciting jobs and complete, which has been said at least three or four times, our national development plan. But I think there's a broader point to make. And I'm not saying any of that's going to be easy. And I'm not saying that there won't be scope for debate and there won't be entrenched interest that we'll have to rationalize and move past. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we have to get started. Because I think there's a broader point is that we're going to do it. And I made a few notes while so f folks were talking. I heard Mr. Hugh talk about Cayman being a global leader. And mind you now, as I said from the outset, I only found out about this speech last night. So that means Mr. Richard Hugh, Ms. Jackie Doak, Ms. Mr. Shamari Scott and I haven't spoken. So we haven't, we haven't shared notes. I didn't know what they were going to say. And Mr. Hugh mentioned global leader about Cayman. Am I right? Is, is Mr. Mr. Richard still here? Yeah. You mentioned global leader, correct? He mentioned also a shared vision for the future. Dynamic Jackie Doak had a quote, together so much we could do together. You also said global leader. You also asked for an unwavering commitment, shared prosperity. Shamar, you also said global leader. So we're going to do this, I think, and the premier thinks with genuine partnership for prosperity. I have one more clip I, wanna, I want you to bear with me on the same interview from Mr. Jamie Dimon. So you come to Washington from time to time to meet regulators and legislators, and how, what kind of experience is that for you? You know, first of all, I think it's important that business get involved in Washington, so I'm not a person who says you never go there. You know, policy is set here. There are a lot of people here who really do care about making it a better country. Uh, and if you don't get involved, that means you'll be set by other people, so it's necessary. You know, obviously, the regulatory environment for banks has been, not just for us, I mean, I travel the United States of America, and when I go to people, you know, groups like this in any city, I mean, I get an earful about regulations completely unrelated to banks. So I do think there's a serious issue about, you know, diminishing a little bit the regulatory uh, burden uh, that's being put in the economy. And, uh, but, you know, I come down, and I do the best I can. It's my job. There should be more. That's it? So we made everybody listen to the, beside the point. I'll finish what he said. He goes on to say, and you can check the interview for yourself, he goes on to say that when you go as business to meet government to ask for something, the interests of the country should come first. and really come for the ass that really, really matter, not the little self-interested thing. Because if the country's doing well, your business would be fine. I didn't say that, Mr. Jamie Dimon said that. And he's right. So we're gonna do this together, but we have to see each other across that table and come to decisions, because that doesn't help politicians to run around trying to dance to the tune of different stakeholders. You've got to come with reasonable proposals that have the country's interests first. Now, that isn't to call out any particular entity. That's just to say that that, I think, is a universal standard that we should all get behind. But on the government side, we also have to be more responsive. And we need to get the easy stuff done. If there's just a simple refund that's something that's supposed to go back from Treasury, answer the email and get the refund done. If we need to give more updates, we should. If, if we know that we're struggling with something, then just call folks in the industry who know and get the answers. I'll give you a small example. I asked if I could shout him out, Jimmy Bertram. His sister happens to also be the president of the Accountants Association. And I was genuinely asking, you know, I'm, I'm new in office, now how, how can we make Cayman Finance even stronger, even better? Just went over to the office. I see you ducking, Jimmy, but sorry to call you out. Um, how, how, just go over to the office, grab Connor, the, the, the chair of Cayman Finance, and let's just talk it through. What are some of the ideas? Why, why should I struggle with this on my own? 
Because together we're stronger. That's what Jackie is saying. That's what Richard is saying. That's what Shamari is saying. So I think if I'm listening to the premier when he called me this morning to apologize, I think what he was, what, what the, the central thrust of what he was saying is that he would like a call to action. And ironically, I think I heard the same call to action from every speaker so far today. So I started to think, like, how can I illustrate this to you all? And I'm just in the study of my library just a few hours ago, and I looked at one of my Cayman history books. Um, and I think this might do it. Um, I don't know if this is going to land. This could bomb. But I'm going to go for it anyway. I happen to have already had highlighted in, um, had a post-it note, to the chapter that talked about the silver thatch industry that used to exist here up until the 1960s. And as you know, it's a natural Cayman resource, and it was a major part of the, a major export at that time, particularly for those who were lower income while the seafarers were out to sea. So that means a lot of women and children were involved in it. And it lasted up until the 1960s, until nylon came along. But when it was at the height, and it was a major, major product, to meet some of the demand, there were folks who were creating an inferior quality of it to get it out. So the government of the day at the time had made, instituted, not made, instituted the following pledge to be taken by the rope makers to uphold standards and protect industry. I quote, I do solemnly pledge my mind and my hands in the production of the standard straw rope for the promotion of trade and for the common good. So what I'm asking you to hear today is to take it into your hearts with a slight edit that we all, I do solemnly pledge my mind and my hands in the production of strong industries for the promotion of these islands as a global center of innovation and excellence for the common good. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? If you don't, just repeat after me, please. I do solemnly pledge my mind and my hands in the production of strong industries for the promotion of these islands as a global center of excellence for innovation and for the common good. If we can do that, if we can get together, if we could not, as Mr. Jamie Diamond said, shoot ourselves in the foot, Cayman is going to be a global leader. And I assure you one day, we hit that target. Whoever is premier will be speaking at the UN. God bless you all. God bless your family. All right, first, first order of business, we need two margaritas up here. Um, this water isn't going to cut it for me, but <laughs> I think we'll, we'll make it through. Um, I, I, I'll for the record, I'll wait for my margarita after this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Minister, Minister Andre was actually mentioning, was it Ronald Reagan? Yeah. Before every speech, he had how much? Just a half a glass of red wine before See? each speech. Half a glass of red wine. No more, no less. Which we didn't have. Which we didn't have. Okay. But <laughs> uh, Minister Andre, I just want to mention that that was an absolutely fabulous speech. Great job. I, you know. <laughs> If I didn't know better, I'd think you're a politician. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point in time, I, I was ready to stand up and say amen. So just want to thank you for you know, your eloquence in, in, in that conversation. Um, what's interesting is we had a list of 10 questions, or more than that, probably about 14, 15, 16 questions. And I was supposed to choose 10 of those questions to ask. But you did such a great job up there, you know, that digital ID and looking at people in the bathroom. I don't believe you were looking at me in the bathroom, but 
I, somehow you must have gotten to my computer because you answered probably eight of the 10 questions in, in your speech. So maybe that digital ID is sooner than I actually thought. Or it's just the brain of the premiere of what would come up. Ah, there we go. <laughs> but the first things first, um, one of the areas that, now sustainability, I don't wanna say it's a buzzword, but at times everybody speaks about sustainability and it means different things to different individuals. Uh, one question I want to ask you in regards to, you know, what's the vision and what's the timeline for us as a country to actually understand what the government means by sustainability and how are we going to protect the environment but balance that with obviously the economic development that needs to happen for us to continue to innovate and to be a great nation? I knew this was going to come up and I asked the premier to send me his words. Hold on. <laughs> Number one, I didn't want to steal his thunder. Um, number two, I don't want to speak outside my wheelhouse. General rule. But I think if he were here while I locate what he sent me, uh, here it is. He'll acknowledge what other speakers like yourself already said today, that it's one of the things that we just have to do. So achieving a balance, these are the Premier's words, between physical development and the protection of our natural environment has been an issue that has plagued successive governments in Cayman over the last several decades. The fact that we haven't yet managed as a country to agree what is sustainable, which is part of your question, means that it likely relates to the complexity of the issue. However, it is the Premier's view, and he believes it's shared by the majority of citizens, that coming to agreement on what sustainable means for our country is the mo one of the most important tasks we'd ever need to tackle. This is the reason why the Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency was chosen, and why in the last administration in which he served, he fought so hard to pass the National Conservation Act. Now going forward, what I think he sees is that there's already a focus on the issue and he started to take certain steps with the support of the cabinet in terms of now starting to update and adopt a national climate change policy, addressing, updating and addressing where necessary the national energy policy, and also taking advantage of recent opportunities where we've had nation, natural capital accounts actually measured, isn't that right, CEO Ahern? And actually there's a parallel there between financial services in terms of being able to monetize that in an exchange and go for carbon offsets. So the Premier is essentially saying that the elephant in the room is the lack of a comprehensive development plan. It needs to be holistic, it needs to be comprehensive, it has that planning policy, it has to incorporate ESG, and it also has to be timely. It's no secret that it's not quite off the ground yet, but now with certain events past us, he's now gonna be working diligently with colleagues in, in caucus and the civil servant to now create a comprehensive plan. Okay, so, so the Premier bailed you on on that one. It was preemptive thinking. <laughs> uh, and and um, so in regards to timing, and I know that obviously that was a lot that was said, so Everybody's been waiting for quite a while and have been successive governments. Do we think it's a year? Do we think it's a year and a half? Do we think it's two years that we'll have that comprehensive plan in order to move it forward? I won't speculate as long because something that large a policy will take some time. Yes. But I think what the country needs to see, at least in my opinion, is that there is a working group that is on it, sets out the plan, even if that slips a little, that everybody could see that should be published to answer your question. Okay, thank you. And in the talk, you were speaking about, obviously, global excellence and innovation being that next pillar of what we're going to do here in the Cayman Islands. Um, you also mentioned the fact that we need to get our young people ready, as well as to retool others that may be in other industries that will need to meander over to take advantage of the opportunities that are actually coming. Um, isn't within your ministry, but obviously at a caucus level, a cabinet level, I'm sure you all would discuss it. 
what are the plans from an education perspective and or a training perspective in regards to ensuring that our young people can take advantage of all these industries that will be coming to us? Knowing that currently we've been very successful, we're very strong, um, half of the working population are people who are not from here, so obviously there are more jobs than people, but how are we going to take advantage in the future and do a better job of making sure our people? A couple of points. I think this is where, again, we can have partnership. Right. So while education begins to assess and not be able to weave this into a curriculum, there are already nonprofits that are doing this now. Mm -hmm. So myself and, um, and he didn't mind me calling his name because I spoke to him this morning, Gene Thompson, we're talking about how we already have, say, robotics camps. But I've gone to one because I've taken my son to one and not a parent showed up. It just turned into a camp. I think what we're gonna have partnership. You have to be able to have the, the parents, as I mentioned in my remarks, take this seriously. Take up NGOs like Code Cayman that are incorporating this kind of tech and coding and robotics into young people. Take up those opportunities. Create with other NGOs educational programs around it while the formal education system adopts its curriculum. All right, so, so that partnership between obviously the private sector has that social contract as well. Correct. And, um, and, and I know a lot of times, obviously, it's the village that raises the child. But if you have a household that's a single parent household, and let's say the mother has two jobs, three jobs, um, obviously managing the household is one of those jobs as well. At times, there may not be that parent that's around. However, I think that's where we, as the community and as employers, as well as social groups, should fill that gap. I remember even being on the national basketball team, we would have been under 12 at the time. And if you were to look at, of the 20 athletes that we had that made the team, probably, I wanna say 14 may have come from single parent households. Um, probably 10 would have been at risk youth. And the greatest accomplishment I remember Coach Root, me Coach Root mentioning was that 95% of his boys went across to get tertiary education and half of them, it was due to basketball. So you're correct, it's partnership in order to make this happen moving forward because it's our Cayman Islands. I'm gonna jump to the next question that has to do with the digital ID. Now banks obviously, and, I, and you shouted out SEMA as well, are regulated by SEMA. With this national ID, what's the plans to, I, I don't want us to get around the regulation, but to allow the national ID to help businesses and um, regular individuals have more seamless processes with, with the banks moving forward. And I don't, I don't think it's about getting around regulation. I actually think it's gonna work seamlessly with regulation right. and facilitate it easier. So as I mentioned, so let me just take a step back to explain where we are in the process and then what we see is some of the key features. So if we take a step back, we are aiming for by the end of this year in the parliamentary sitting to have the enabling legislation before the House. In addition to that, the e-government team that has been working flat out mm -hmm. has all already have the tech in place for the card itself. So we're gonna start a series of consultation and surveys with Chamber of Commerce and other entities to actually give feedback on the card itself. And hopefully you will become third party validators and some of you be able to see the technology for yourself. So if I'm on the radio talking about it, it'll, like, it actually makes sense to you. Now what should happen in terms of you as the individual should be able to choose the set of data that you would like on the card. And then you'd be able to give certain permissions to financial institutions of what you'd want them to see. So rather than having, you still have the same sort of due diligence that SEMA will require under regulation, but you'd have it digitally. And rather than having to run into the next financial institution with all of your paper copies all over again, you should be able to click a button, give access, and then it's gone, so you haven't even left your couch. And still complied with regulation. Right. That round of applause, that's right. Now, obviously this is solely, not solely, but definitely in your wheelhouse. Um, financial services and legislation and, and regulation. As we innovate and as we understand that financial services is one of the key pillars, is there anything the government's looking at from a removal of regulation perspective or anything new that you're 
putting into, into effect in order to ensure that the industry keeps growing? It's an excellent question. And I'm glad you brought it up because I mentioned this in the house when it was my, my first bill, which was a new part five to the Companies Act that brings on a new restructuring regime for the liquidator and insolvency practitioners will know what I'm talking about. But in that speech, which answers your question, is that what we see is to have a balance between any regulation that's coming and also new products. Because if there's any necessary legislation that we have to do to comply with regulation, and that's all industries over the time, then of course there's regulatory fatigue. But if you can explain why we're doing something from a regulatory standpoint and how it enhances the Cayman Islands, but at the same time bring on new products, then you can continue to keep the industry excited and enthusiastic and also external stakeholders excited. So companies, part five, passed in the house, hopefully comes online by the end of Q2. We're also planning commercial enhancements to the Exempted Limited Partnership Act, commercial enhancements to the Companies Act, we just did the in insurance and new product, the capital redemption contracts. That was passed in the last sitting of parliament. And we're also working with STEP to bring on, actually in this, this new one that we're tinkering with now, is called an enduring power of attorney, which also could have some benefits to our seniors here. So if I could just plug for a second, um, right. the Financial Services Legislative Committee, which does a great job of, for years, not just under this administration, for years, of bringing ideas and legislation together, having a policy that's written to government, and then we pass a cabinet paper, get the drafting instructions, and a huge heap of legislation has come from that committee. The LLC law, the LLP law, other changes, foundation companies that took off in a direction that I don't think was even anticipated at first. That committee does a large body of work, and we want to continue on that path. Thank you, Minister. Um, cryptocurrency, where are we on that journey here in the Cayman Islands? Well, I want to unpack this in, in, a, in a couple of different ways, because I know it's a hot topic. And I'll, I'll share with you the, the recent trip that myself, the MD of SEMA was on, and also um, Charlie Cocano's CEO of the uh, Cayman Enterprise City, and Gene DaCosta was there. And we were at a regulatory conference in Switzerland specifically designed between the Swiss regulator and the Singapore regulator about having a conversation about where we are with cryptocurrencies as a, as a world, as a globe. The interesting thing is, if anybody keeps up with this stuff, you can see that cryptocurrencies are struggling right now. So the, the kind of interesting quiet giggle in the room around the regulators is if we'd have went to these folks seven, eight months ago, they might have said, ah, we don't need any regulation, we're fine, everything's rosy. But now that things have kind of hit a bump in the road, they're kind of saying, well, now actually we need the regulation, we need you because we need to separate the jokers out of the deck and keep the real cards. So the answer to your question is, it's already included in what I, made, what I mentioned in my remarks about our vast legislation, and that should come online to, to help with that. But I think, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, that the cryptocurrency is just a smaller aspect of the real opportunity, which is the blockchain technology that underlines the cryptocurrency. That has the ability to change a lot. It has the ability to automate so many things. It has the ability to have smart contracts, eliminate unnecessary steps in a process. So, and also, I also think it could be a means in which public authorities share information because it's encrypted and locked. And you turn it from maybe it started out with maybe a darker history into a positive. So I'm actually excited, even more excited about the actual blockchain technology and its applications um, than just maybe what might be right now a flavor of cryptocurrencies. I think the real opportunity is in the blockchain technology. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about renewable energy. So the premier, when he was at a conference, um, recently enough, I say recent, but the months uh, roll forward, I think it was a few months ago, um, made an announcement about the fact that the government um, would have more of an ownership stake in the future projects when it comes to renewable energy. Is there any update on that or any timeline as to when we'll get some more details in that regards? I will leave that firmly in his court when he gets over COVID to make that announcement. Let's call him right now. You, uh, well, no, I don't think, probably sleeping now. 
Okay. Um, the other one of the other questions we had um, at the front of the question, I said I would leave that to last if if we had any other if we ran out of questions. Um, Will, how much time do we have? Ten minutes. You see? Well, ten minutes. So we're ahead of time. So Will is happy. Um, He's smiling. But, <laughs> one of the questions had to do with um, transparency and if and what the government will be doing in the future to ensure that the regular populace has more information about the projects that are going, um, as well as the running of government and for there to be a touch point with more communication was one of the, one of the questions. It's a good question. I actually want to test something to, to answer that question. How many people realize that every week the cabinet decisions are published? See, not as many as I thought. I, this happened to me at a, as a constituency meeting. We might need to talk, CEOs, we might need to talk with GIS about that and pump up the volume, but th for the first time, as far as I know, um, Governor, this administration has taken this step to publish every, not monthly, weekly cabinet decisions so you can see the decisions that are being made. In addition to that, we also publish the decisions that are made at the National Security Council level. So that's at a top level. I think the challenge for, for each minister, and I put myself in it, so I don't put anybody else in it, is to try to come out from, from reading loads of documents and answering correspondence to get more out there and to, to have enter into discussions with your industry. So right now, for example, I'm talking to Cayman Finance and trying to see if I can make more of their meetings. Because it's not that you end up shying away that you don't want to take the meeting, but you're so overloaded with correspondence, you need something in the calendar to kind of bring you up for air and then make a meeting. So they're working with me because typically their board meetings are on Tuesdays. Like, that's a disaster. That's cabinet. That's never going to work. You need to get me a meeting that I can actually get to so that we can try to switch to Wednesdays. So I think the challenge, as you said, Strand is laughing, the, the, the challenge, I think, is for ministers to kind of set a placeholder in your calendars to be able to make sure that you're communicating. You can be doing really good work, but if nobody's actually seeing it or hearing it or missing it, it could kind of feel like nothing's happening. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, I, I read the cabinet minister's minutes, but I know at times I, I, I know where to find it, right? So um, see, obviously- that, See, but that isn't good. Exactly. It should be obvious. Exactly, exactly. The other question um, had to do with cross-ministerial collaboration and what the government's doing to ensure more cross-ministry collaboration as well as more collaboration throughout the districts. Okay, so cross-collaboration between ministries happens every week in caucus. So this is another thing I kind of want to test that I tested at a constituency meeting. Does everybody here know what caucus is and who's in caucus? Yeah? That's good for this crowd. I'd be really worried if, if, if you didn't. <laughs> uh, but just for anybody listening at home who may not know, caucus is all the government members that meet every week before cabinet. So the cross-ministerial collaboration you talk about happens there. So we'll discuss national issues and then we'll, we'll break at times so to talk about what might be happening between two different ministries. Now at a district level, the composition in each district is different, but in the case of West Bay, each, uh, each of, the, of the members already know each other and work together to a degree and can give a district-wide update. But what I said at a public meeting last week is that I, I I personally, and I think we were all agreed as, as the West Bay MPs, want to start a constituency advisory council, which brings up constituency issues. Now, there's a couple of people in this room I have an eye on to be on that. But just to give you ease of mind, it's not that you would be running around to fetch things because we already have constituency offices. It's really to notify me as the MP of what's actually happening on the ground. And then what I think should happen is that once I have that information, there's bound to be things that will be cross-constituency, meet with that MP and their council, if they've established one or the MP directly, to figure out how we're going to solve it together. And um, so, subsea cable, is that one that you're gonna be able to, to speak to? Yeah, I mean, as far as I, as far as I know, the Minister Jay Ebanks yes. has that now squarely, I think there've been actually job adverts to actually support it. Somebody said yes, right? So that, I think that train is moving. 
I think that they are trying to work out the mechanics behind it and how they'll be sharing between the private sector, but that is firmly on his plate right now. The reason that it's key is because if, if we don't have that supporting infrastructure, then a lot of what I did say today would be pie in the sky. We, need, we desperately need that other cable to facilitate transactions and tech. And, and there's interaction with the private sector. Is there going to be private sector ownership, or is the government taking it fully on board and going to make the investments to make it happen? I mean, I will let Minister Jay not steal his thunder, thunder and answer the level of participation, but to my mind, they, they, would, they would need to be. Well, Will, the, I ran out of the questions that I have, but I know you typically um, move through the crowd, and we have, what, three minutes left? So that's yep. one more question prior to letting you off the hot seat, Minister Ebanks. One or two questions from the audience. Here's one here. Hello, uh, my name is Sabrina Foster. I have a question on housing. Um, housing for some of our less privileged um, citizens and residents and how we can tackle that as a government and as a community. Now, Sabrina is politely introducing herself as if I don't know her when I was a junior attorney working under these of her at, at Applebee where she made me do all sorts of things. So I'm not surprised she's decided to direct the question my way. Um, it is one of the challenges that we obviously have. It dominated the campaign last year. I'm gonna to try to break it down in two parts and speak from where I see with the social development hat I have on, which is social housing as separate and distinct from say affordable housing. So in respect of social housing, Right now, our welfare system depends mostly, almost 90, 90% on private landlords renting to those who might need welfare housing. That causes a number of issues because it's subject to the fluctuation of the amount of rent, it's subject to whether the landlord will even take someone who's on financial assistance. So we have, are now in the process of identifying crown land that is attributable or assigned to the Ministry of Social Development and work to put on housing there that can now balance the market so you have more, so there's not such a stress for the welfare client to where they're going to live and reduce that pressure. On the other hand, the cabinet has created a task force to work on housing that's going to, I'm a member of, the Premier is a member of, Minister Jay is a member of, the DP is a member of, and Mr. Bryan is a member of in relation to transport, that's going to more so look at affordable housing for those people who are working, relatively affluent, but just can't get into the market. That is going to take a different combination of factors, and there's already plans within the Ministry of Lands to identify Crown land where we can put homes on that either have vacant, no, actually, rephrase, have vacant lots to people who want to build at an affordable rate, and then also build structures that people can afford to help to try to balance the market. But that issue is one of those issues that I think is definitely going to take partnership between the public sector and the private sector. So I'm excited about getting that committee off the ground and do my part from the social development standpoint, but I think there's a longer, much wider conversation that will happen between real estate industry, development industry, and government in terms of housing and infrastructure to try to tackle that, because it's a sad scene if you have Caymanians who just can't purchase or are, would have the ability to purchase but someone swoops in with cash and they beat them to the punch. And that person might not live in Cayman and have never been to Cayman. We cannot have that in this country. Well, that wraps up the time that we have this, sorry about that, it wraps up the time that we have for this afternoon. So put your hands together for the chamber conversation. So I'd now like to invite President-elect Nelson Dilbert to come forward for the vote of thanks. Good afternoon. 
I'm not used to dressing so um, dressed up like this. I usually wear flip-flops, and the chamber team said that uh, they were disappointed in the fact that I was all dressed up. But nonetheless, I did it, so I'm happy to say, yeah, I did. I want to uh, thank the minister, uh, Ebanks, again, for his uh, wonderful speech today. It really inspired me, and, um, and as a young Caymanian trying to, as a young small business owner, I have to say, I'm really impressed. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. On, on behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone for attending today's parliamentary lunch. We hope that you enjoyed your lunch today and the interactions with your elected le leaders and public servants. It is a, it's great to see so many members supporting the event. We'd like to thank His Excellency the Governor, the Premier, Speaker of Parliament, Cabinet members, the public servants, for continuing to support this event. Chamber members appreciate your willingness to engage with them and hope that you find this interaction enjoyable as we do. Special thanks to CUC, DART, Digicel for serving as VIP sponsors. Your contribution to this event is not only financially, uh, but, uh, but providing us with updates of your activities, plans, and pri priorities. Thank you, Richard and Jackie. We truly appreciate your support. We would like to acknowledge the 30 corporation, corporate members who reserved the tables at the event. Your banners are proudly uh, displayed around the room and represent a diversity of the chamber membership and in the variety of industry sectors. Thank you for your contribution and support. We'd like to thank the three dozen small businesses who took the time to attend. Since more than 65% of the chamber members are small business owners, this sector, this sector Vitally, is vitally important to our economy and to your, your, your contributions and innovations are to be celebrated. The Ritz-Carlton Grand Cayman has been an amazing. Tamara Davis, Director of Meetings and Special Events Planning. Lavinia uh, Pomen, Pomain, a Sales Executive. And Troy Shahiri, I think. Uh, audio and Visual uh, Supervisor uh, and Event ban Management Team for working hard to make this event a success. We enjoy working with your team and look forward to future events. Special thanks to April and Rick from Cayman Spaces for providing live coverage and video recording of the event and media representatives for attending. The live coverage enables communities to hear important messages that we share today. We truly are grateful. Lastly, I'd like to thank Will, Nina, Vanessa from the Chamber team for organizing this event. We all know that it takes a lot of moving parts to put this, uh, or organizing this event, and the Chamber team works diligently to ensure that everything runs smoothly and on time. Thank you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again at future Chamber events. Thank you again.